as has been previously established, I am a huge fan of Yu-Gi-Oh, but unfortunately I'm a fan that's personally unfamiliar with a lot of the franchise's history. I watched all of the original series and the good half of 5Ds, but that's it out of the six series that have aired, and the seventh that just started. I also really like the card game, but I don't so much like playing it with people, so I wasn't familiar with cards released past, oh, 2010 or so. My distaste for playing with people stems from going to local tournaments as a kid, and I will by no means pretend that I had a good deck, but everyone there just ran whatever infinite loop or lockdown combo hadn't been banned yet. In my day, everyone ran Painful Choice to turbo out Blackluster Soldier on for the beginning, who banishes all your monsters before you can use their effects, then played Magical Scientist to place some fusion monster that was immune to all your traps, and topped it off with Yadagarasu, who completely stops you from drawing, and then retreats to the hand so you can't destroy it, all of those at once so you get completely locked out of playing by turn two. I quit going out of disgust, and shortly afterward, Konami banned basically every card in those decks, several of them still to this day. Of course, that just led to GOAT format where Metamorphosis was used to turbo out Thousand Eyes Restrict and lock down both fields, and I reiterate, whatever lockdown combo or degenerate loop hadn't been banned yet. Although I do have one priceless memory from those tournament days, I was running Tornado Wall, a trap that prevents you from taking any battle damage, and I was dueling someone who was using three ground collapses, which stops you from summoning monsters. We ended up in a complete stalemate where neither of us could damage the other. We held up the entire tournament as everyone else huddled around our table, enraptured by the single worst game of Yu-Gi-Oh! that had ever been played. Uh, eventually I won because I was running more than 40 cards, he ran out of draws before I did, and then the exact same stalemate almost happened in our second round, and by then the novelty had worn off and everyone there wanted to strangle us. <laughs> Anyway, I wanted to play Yu-Gi-Oh! with the newest cards in the game, but I'd like to try them against players who don't run Tier 0 meta decks, and I didn't have the time to binge over 100 hours of anime catching up on the TV series much as I'd like to. But luckily in 2015, Konami killed both my birds with one stone, called the video game Yu-Gi-Oh! Legacy of the Duelist, featuring story campaigns for all five shows at the time, and featuring all the game's up-to-date cards with a ton of single-player content. I might have bought the game if it didn't require around $70 of story details. DLC to complete it! When the sixth anime Yu-Gi-Oh! Vrains ended in 2019, Konami capitalized with a re-release of the game Legacy of the Duelist Link Evolution, complete with all the original game's DLC, a new campaign, all the latest cards, and even updated rules. The game was released exclusively on the Switch, but I believe it's getting ported everywhere else in the near future, and it's pretty much become my definitive time sync game that I play idly all the time, so... Heck it, let's talk about it. The game has six story campaigns representing each of the Yu-Gi-Oh! animes. Each series is broken into two to three dozen duels from the show, complete with cutscenes reenacting the show's story with still sprites and text boxes. Each duel you have the option of using the deck the protagonist used in the show, which is a cool feature for fans to roleplay, or you can duel using one of your own decks. You start with five starter decks that are pretty much completely useless, but every duel you get cash to spend on booster packs, with more packs unlocking as you progress through each story. Everyone has different advice for getting started in the game, but I recommend buying a ton of the Grandpa Moto pack that comes unlocked. He'll give you Gravekeeper cards that'll easily carry you through the first three campaigns. I was advised to make a Thunder Dragon deck using Kaiba's packs, and then Thunder Dragons got their key playmakers banned. You are allowed to cheat and use banned cards in the single player modes, but I have more integrity than that, Damn it! If I'm gonna cheat, I might as well use the cheap asshole Seekers Exodia deck that instant wins on opening draw. The story mode has a framing device where you're viewing and interacting with history files as seen over by this robot, and now I really wish we'd get a Yu-Gi-Oh game with a Dragon Ball Xenoverse setup, like some great evil is trying to destroy history and you'd play as a time traveler intervening on key duels to restore the timeline. It'd be an easy premise to buy into, given how abysmal most of the protagonist's decks are, without a writer rigging all the matches. I'm not joking, a staggering number of story decks are shockingly useless in the name of faithfulness to the source material. Yugi's deck will brick constantly on Dark Magicians that do nothing and you can barely use, and he's still got some of the better story decks because he packs good spells and traps. Jaden's elemental heroes were never very good, but they'd be more tolerable if half the levels didn't strip out most of the fusions the deck is built around. And don't get me started on all the levels that expect you to win with Jaden's Neos deck, when Neos is one of the most legendarily useless sets in the game. Neos can't make basic plays without extensive spell support and drain 
draining most of your hand with miserable draw power to make up for it. All his baseline monsters except Grand Mole have useless stats and effects, they have abysmal swarming capabilities so it's a royal bitch to play any of their fusions, their bosses are mediocre apart from three that Jaden doesn't have, they have pathetic back row removal and shit recovery options so a single trap will end you, and even if somehow you get one of their crappy boss monsters onto the field, they only stay there one turn without even more spell support. How Jaden managed to avoid getting his ass kicked every episode of the anime is a mystery for the ages. You say has good boss monsters but no way to actually play them quickly, so his deck is built around stall cards to buy time to slowly set up combos. Not only is that a really boring way to play, but if you don't draw any stall cards or combo pieces or if your opponent gets off one good counter, you're pretty much hosed with absolutely no way to make a comeback. And what's worse is that Yusei does have cards that search out and draw the synchrons he needs for his combos, but I think he only uses each in one level! Yuma, the protagonist of Zexel, runs no protection effects, no recovery effects, no back row removal, and the game axes all of his boss monsters except Utopia Ray, whose already worthless effect only works if you're about to lose in a really specific way. His deck is basically a stack of pack filler, garbage attack boosters, and beat sticks, so he has no answer to the vast majority of strategies in the game. One solid trap and his entire deck collapses, especially since he can't use his knockoff Millennium Puzzle to rig his draws and cheat like he does in the anime. Yuya's deck is fine once he starts plundering good boss cards off the bodies of his dead clones, but the first several story missions his deck has zero offensive capability and can't do anything, especially since he can't just invent and pull new spells out of his ass every time he's about to lose like he does in the anime. After you beat a story mode duel you can play a reverse duel where you play as the villain kicking the hero's ass, and I can't tell you how cathartic it was bashing Jaden, Yusei, and Yuma's heads together until they learned to back some decent damn cards! A huge chunk of the fun of the game, and part of what's kept me playing for several months, is that there are tons of decks you can build and experiment with, and several have unique playstyles. The deck building process is simple and intuitive, with not only several ways to search and sort cards by name, stats, and effects, but the ability to take a card and pull up a list of absolutely every card that interacts with it, even pointing out cards that you're missing. And if you need a template to get started with an unfamiliar deck, you get recipes for the decks of every opponent that you've defeated, plus if you're missing a specific card and can't get it in booster packs for the life of you, beating an opponent will give you three cards from their deck, excluding any that you already have three copies of. It's a really convenient way to get specific cards quickly. The only problem with deck building is that you're only allowed to keep 32 decks saved at once, and if you're wondering why that's bad, there are a bit more than 32 archetypes in the game. Some of my personal favorites are my Cyber Dragon deck with great consistency and tons of one turn kill and control potential, my Raid Raptor deck with loads of swarming and turbo exceeds combos that punish extra deck summons and have just enough restrictions to require creativity, my Different Dimension deck that swamps the field with boss monsters using all the summoning methods as long as you keep the deck carefully balanced, but my all time favorite is my Blackwing deck with great adaptability thanks to easy access to a toolbox of synchro monsters, but there are tons of decks to play with past that. It's a very fun and rewarding process, picking out an archetype or theme that you want to experiment with, a bit of grind to gather all the cards that you need, testing out the deck on weak opponents to see what works and make tweaks, working up the stronger opponents, the struggle makes your creation that much more satisfying until you've got a fun and powerful new deck to use. Or until you cave, admit the deck is unplayable and trash it, which has happened repeatedly to me, trying to make decks of scraps, rockets, ignisters, and photons. Also, remember when I reviewed Yu-Gi-Oh! World Championship Tournament 2004 and I said that a deck with no spells or traps was the single dumbest thing that a player could do? Well, apparently Konami took that to mean a challenge because seven months after that review went live, they created the Super Heavy Samurai, an army of sick-ass robots built around not having any spells or traps in the deck. I invented an archetype and I finally get to play it! The deck kinda sucks, but I can name a few dozen worse ones! Playing the story campaigns in order gives the game a good difficulty curve, certain spikes like Seeker and Zone notwithstanding. I've been asked a few times what Yu-Gi-Oh game I'd recommend as a good gateway into the series, and given how the campaigns gradually introduce you to summoning mechanics one by one so you're not overwhelmed, I'd say this is probably a pretty good entry point. Since the story mode decks by and large are relatively weak, each character also has a challenge deck, more modernized and competitive decks to make for stronger and vastly more varied opponents. More useless, however, is the game's battle pack mode 
mode where you duel AI opponents with random cards earned from a pax. Every time I've played this mode, I've just been slaughtered by cheap mass destruction effects with no cards to counter or recover, so beats me what the hell the purpose of this mode is. The game's interface is pretty good, making a lot of information about cards available at a glance and displaying card text without needing to go into menus. The only problem I have with the interface is there are some actions, like summoning a monster, where if you select the wrong prompt on accident, you aren't given an option to cancel it. The AI is fairly competent as far as Yu-Gi-Oh games go, but granted the series standards are pretty low in that regard. Decks with draw engines, the AI might sit on ass drawing for all eternity and never make an actual play against you. Certain cards like Icarus Attack, it's easy to trick the AI into destroying its own stuff. The AI can't always figure out how its moves change the field, playing defense right before weakening your monsters, for instance, and Joey has tried repeatedly to use effects on a monster that's immune to effects. Though in fairness, that's a very Joey thing to do. Less defensible is one card that I use quite heavily is Cyber Dragon Seeger, a card that can double its attack strength in mid-battle. The AI will completely forget and suicide monsters into Seeger multiple times a duel if given the chance. I say if given the chance because if you screw up against Cyber Dragons, there usually isn't a next turn. But again, I've played a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh games and I've seen way, way dumber. I've yet to see a single AI kill itself by paying too many life points, so yeah, not so bad. On the whole, I feel like Legacy of the Duelist Link Evolution is a really solid game. It has a lot of single player content with lots of varied opponents to play against, it's friendly to beginners, it has a great interface, and a lot of fan service for the more nostalgic among us. Link Evolution is a pretty good game but it has two major problems that keep it from being a great game for me. The first problem is the storyline, because if you're a fan of the show, you'll be baffled by what got cut, and if you're not a fan of the anime, you'll just be confused. The first series reenacts just about all of the Duelist Kingdom arc, you know, the start of the show where they hadn't settled on the rules yet and everyone's deck sucked ass, but Battle City, which is by far the most iconic part of the series, is really cut down. They completely skip over Merrick kidnapping and brainwashing Yugi's friends, so not only does it skip the best dramatic bits of the story, it completely neuters the franchise's most iconic villain. The Orichalcos arc is gutted to just a few levels, the Grand Championship and Virtual World arcs are cut altogether, not that I'm surprised, and they skip over the entire final season straight to the final duel, largely without context. The GX campaign feels more cohesive, largely because GX barely had a story most of the time, so at least when huge chunks are cut from the plot, the layman is less likely to notice, aside from Aster and Emo Zane getting big intros and never being resolved. Incidentally, fans have long debated how the final duel between Jaden and Yugi ended in GX's finale. Yeah, Yugi wins with Black Luster Soldier beatdown, while Jaden desperately tries to draw the only two good cards in his deck because he can't handle a single beat stick with no effect. The 5D's campaign cuts four of the six protagonists almost completely out of the story, nukes every character arc, and abridges the second half of the series down to Yusei and Jack enter a tournament and bad guys happen. It's kind of baffling to see the retelling of GX take a ton of downtime for good character development, while 5D's is just cut to the bone. I've been told that the second half of the Zexal anime is actually supposed to be really good. Earth is caught in a war between two morally gray alien races, the villains aren't really all bad guys, and lots of characters get killed off. Yeah, Legacy chucks all that out the window, makes all the Baryans generic kill crazy assholes, and they pretty much cut all the leads except Yuma and Shark, who, incidentally, I'm on the fence whether Shark's wholly unsynergized deck is even worse than Yuma's, believe it or not. The bigger problem, though, is that Zexal's plot turns on a lot of magic MacGuffins that the game doesn't bother to explain at all, like Yuma's weird knockoff Millennium Puzzle, the plot MacGuffin number cards that seem to do five different things, the Baryans aren't explained, Astroworld is only even mentioned maybe twice, and why the hell can Yuma go Super Saiyan? Hey, uh, Don Thousand's cars were way too broken to print in real life, what should we give Zexel's main villain? Was that generic rank 4 deck the players already fought a half dozen times? Yeah, I can do that. The plot of Arc 5 translates to the game pretty well since the bulk of the series is just one big war, but probably also because the entire campaign was originally a series of paid DLC packages, so they milked that shit for all it was worth. 
Yeah, Yu-Gi-Oh! Arc 5 is about the protagonist visiting the worlds of other sequel series. The GX Dimension is run by evil Nazis enacting genocide, the Zexal Dimension has been wiped out apart from one fan-favorite character, and the 5Ds Dimension is the really important one they spend a whole season fighting over while reenacting the first season of 5Ds. Gee, I wonder which sequel series was the favorite. Also, series grand champion waifu Alexis is back, doing nothing but stand in the background with breasts the size of watermelons! <laughs> I just don't get why these series had to be trimmed down so badly. All it takes to make a new level is a few decks and some text boxes. It's been suggested that a lot of scenes were cut so you wouldn't have multiple duels against the same character, but that didn't stop them having three or more duels against Jack, Kaiba, Mai, Chaz, Ghost Gal, or Janus! But at the end of the day, the storyline isn't a huge problem. The plots are still compelling enough to drive the game. What is a huge problem? is the game's second major issue. Even most of the game's challenge opponents are super weak because most of the decks in the game are woefully out of date, and properly explaining this is going to take a bit of a history lesson on the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game. Yu-Gi-Oh! started as a fairly simple card game. Summon monsters in attack or defense mode, play spells and traps to supplement those monsters, higher level monsters you need to tribute monsters that are already in play, and an extra deck off to the side for if you had one of the five or so fusion cards that were worth a crap. But the card game and the anime exist in symbiosis, and every few years when a new anime series would come out needing a new gimmick, Konami would add a new mechanic to the card game. GX's gimmick was fusion monsters that don't suck, and 5D's gimmick was synchro monsters. New monsters would have Tuner written as part of their text, meaning that you could combine them with other monsters, total their levels, and play a Synchro monster whose level matched the total. Synchros were easier to play than fusions, so power creep ensued and the gameplay sped up a bit. Zexel's gimmick was the infuriating to pronounce Xyz monsters. Now if you play two monsters the same level, you can stack them on top of each other and play an Xyz monster, which detaches its stacked cards to trigger effects. Xyz monsters were easier to play than Synchro, so again, power creep ensued and the game sped up a bit. Shit didn't hit the fan until Yu-Gi-Oh! Arc 5 introduced Pendulum monsters. Pendulum monsters can be set in the board's new pendulum zones as spell cards, and each pendulum monster has a scale on it. If both pendulum scales are full, you can instantly play any monsters in your hand whose levels fall between the scales. The problem is that pendulum monsters don't actually get destroyed when they're destroyed. They go to the extra deck, where they can be resummoned the next turn. And again the turn after that. And again the turn after that. An entire genre of immortal cards that let you dump up to five monsters onto the field every turn for free! Endlessly reviving beat sticks or tribute fodder, and giving you endless instant fuel for Xyz summons. I don't know how Konami foresaw zero problems with letting players dump five free monsters a turn, but it's far, 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 FAR from their first disastrously bad idea. Pendulum cards completely broke the game and sent the speed of the game into overdrive. It was open season on one turn kills, and almost immediately Konami started floundering to try and rebalance them. Every non-Pendulum archetype that was worth saving got new cards to give them massive power and speed boosts, notorious field nuke cards Darkhole and Raigeki were unbanned, and Konami invented a new monster called the blue Eye Spirit Dragon that nuked Pendulum summoning down to one card a turn, making the game's most iconic monster tier zero overnight. <laughs> So why the history lesson, besides an excuse to flex my nerd boner? Well, Link Evolution is largely an unmodified port of the original game, and the first legacy of the Duelist was developed at the very start of the Pendulum era. Link Evolution has five to six years of vastly rebalanced and more powerful cards that have been released since its initial development, and almost none of the AIs use these newer cards. Outside of the more recent Arc 5 Duelists that were added to the original as DLC, the AI AIs use cards that are substantially weaker than the ones you have access to, and even the challenge decks that were intended to be difficult, only a select few of the non-Arc 5 decks have aged well enough to actually be threatening. You could make a valid argument that, hey, at least the game has a few hard duelists with the Arc 5 characters, no harm, no foul, except it feels weird that all the protagonists are stuck with badly gimped cards for their ultimate decks. Kaiba doesn't get to use the Blue Eyes alternative or Chaos Max Dragons he got for the new movie, Yugi doesn't get to use the new Magician Girls or BLS retrains, Joey's stuck with a garbage fire Jinzo deck that does absolutely nothing, 
Ring instead of his new Red Eyes cards, and Jaden's stuck trying hilariously to use the craptastic original E Heroes as an Xyz engine. The biggest characters in the series are stuck with abysmal decks because Konami couldn't be bothered to actually update the vast majority of the content for a new release. People with a bit of experience in Yu-Gi-Oh or people who piece together a good deck with modern cards aren't really going to be able to find a lot of good challenges or opponents that can actually put up a fight. Yusei's Assault Mode Stardust Dragon challenge deck has aged pretty well, though. Good to see that my ass kickings taught him a lesson. So did Konami ever fix the game from Pendulums? Eh, they've been trying. When the sixth anime Yu-Gi-Oh! Vrains came out, Konami introduced Master Rule 4. The Pendulum Zones now occupy spell and trap spaces to actively punish you for using them, and now the board has two new spaces called Extra Zones. Under Master Rule 4, you are allowed to play one single Fusion, Synchro, Xyz, or Extra Deck Pendulum Summon at a time in this Extra Zone, and that's it. They nuked Pendulums down to a fraction of their former strength, but they nuked all the other summoning mechanics along with it. So unless you were running a Ritual Deck or something like Time Lords, you could use one of your deck's key cards at a time, and that's it. Vrains also introduced Link Monsters, which you summon by just combining any monsters on your field, and Link Monsters mark other zones on the field so you can play more than one extra deck monster. Translation, buy the new Link cards or else eat a massive nerf to your deck, shithead. Master Rule 4 was clearly intended to slow the game down by adding a bottleneck to the extra deck, but it was too little too late. The Pendulum Era arms race had already created several engines for playing a lot of monsters quickly without pendulums. That cat isn't going back in the bag without a ban list that can circle the earth. All Master Rule 4 did was annoy people by forcing them to retool their decks around the new Link cards, which were so generic and abusable that they were still spamming several Link monsters a turn. Link Evolution launched with these wildly unpopular rules that not only bogged the game down, but rendered the Arc 5 Pendulum decks that weren't designed for the new rules floundering and completely unable to function. It also made the game annoying because you were kind of forced to use Link monsters, but not a lot of good Link monsters actually made it into the game before it launched. As much as I completely despise the concept of mega patches being used to try and salvage a game post-launch, this one was well justified. Link Evolution received a mega patch in March of 2020 that not only added a ton of new cards, but it updated the game to Master Rule 5. Fusion, Synchro, and Xyz summonings are now back to working the way they used to, while Pendulums stay buried where they fucking belong. I'm guessing the real-life card game is still a hot mess since Dark Hole isn't limited at all anymore, but the update sure made Link Evolution way more fun to play. The Mega Patch also added in the Vrain story campaign that was MIA at launch, which, quite frankly, I'm immensely surprised that Konami released all of this to the game for free. The Vrains campaign has no cutscenes because the English dub is nowhere near finished, so you have no clue what's going on, and because several of the characters in Vrains haven't had their cards printed in real life, they're given ancient, barely functional substitutes that don't use the Link monsters that Vrains was known for. The AI barely knows how to use Link monsters and will keep hurling summons around burning through its extra deck whether it actually helps or not, but past that the decks just feel really weak. You can't really blame this on the video game because only five Link era decks were actually strong enough to get nuked by the ban list and the rest just kind of feel useless, but the bulk of the expansion's content just feels slapped together and kind of lazy. Also, I know that Vrains was a production nightmare that actually got cancelled early with loads of plot unresolved, but it still strikes me as a bad sign that about half the Vrains levels have you playing as the villains and the protagonist just kind of drops out for pretty much the entire second half of the campaign. I really hope that this review was semi-comprehensible between all my ramblings on the series history, but in case it wasn't, here are the bullet points. Solid game, great trip down memory lane for fans of the anime, loads of fun to play and experiment with all the decks, but lots of the opponents are too weak because they were too lazy to update certain parts of the game. It's a good game that just could have been so much more, which frankly is about the best that Konami gets these days.